Good evening, and thank you all for tuning in tonight. Uh, with things starting to open up a little bit, the emergency management team looked at uh, different parks and play structures, along with a skate park and basketball court. And at this time, it, we did not feel comfortable opening up any of the playground structures or the basketball court because of the medium high risk of exposure, getting within the six foot uh, social distancing and all of that and touch surfaces. But we have uh, decided that we will open up the uh, skate park effective tomorrow, Saturday the 16th, with uh, some certain stipulations. And the chair of that committee, Casey Romero, will be available to answer any questions on exactly how that's going to work. But that's a low to medium risk uh, contact surfaces and, and uh, getting within a six foot social distancing and, and all of that. So we did feel very comfortable opening up that particular uh, part of the skateboard park. If for those of you who may have listened to the governor's news conference today, he extended the state of emergency out to June 15th. He has relaxed the stay at home order to some degree. It's a be smart, stay safe type of order. It is recommended if you're over 65 or have underlying health issues, you should continue to stay at home. But he has relaxed that to some degree. For May 22nd, next Friday, lodging and accommodations will be opening. You, they may start accepting reservations to a 25% capacity. Uh, there will be restrictions also issued with that. Between now and June 1st, they're anticipating more openings will be coming of different types of businesses from uh, beauty salons to barbershops, et cetera. Uh, daycare openings with restrictions, obviously, they, they're in place now. He did announce that the uh, education fund has a projected gap of 170 million, which I'm sure Secretary French will probably talk to to some degree. Um, one thing that is we can be proud of here in Johnson, and it's not just by chance, it's because of all the hard work of everyone in Johnson and what they've been doing maintaining social distancing and facial mask and, and on and stuff like that. But as of this date, we still have zero positives in Johnson, which is a good thing to celebrate. Uh, Brian, have you seen if Gordy did make it or not? I haven't seen him. I'm checking again right now. Uh, I don't he was believe having trouble. That. Okay. Um, the other thing I just was asked to at least share and announce is the National the Vermont National Guard will be at the Morrisville Stowe State Airport in uh, Morrisville on Friday the 22nd from 10 to 2, distributing non-perishable food boxes along with produce, chicken, and da dairy products provided by the Abbey Group. Anyone is welcome to come and pick up that food. Each household will receive one farmer's to family kit containing two gallons of milk, two boxes of meat, 10 pounds of grilled chicken filet strip, and 10 pounds of breaded chicken tenders patties. One box of fresh produce, 15 to 25 pounds of assorted vegetables. One box of Cabot dairy products, four pounds cheddar cheese, one and a half pounds American cheese, two pounds of butter. Each household will receive one box of non-perishable food, about 20 pounds. And we are exploring now to get uh, some ME, uh, MRIs here and available in Johnson. Uh, we'll follow up with more information as that becomes available. With that, do we know if uh, Secretary French is online? I want to thank you for taking your time tonight out to introduce and welcome to our community Zoomcast, Secretary of Education, Daniel French. Go ahead, Secretary. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, beautiful evening. Um, 
Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, understand we have some time for question and answer, but I thought I'd make a few remarks um, for give you a perspective, my perspective on the COVID-19 response to date, uh, you know, obviously largely focused on the educational um, work. Um, but it's been a tremendous effort, as you know, for all, all community leaders, uh, applaud all of you for your leadership. Um, and I specifically want to thank parents for their patience and uh, for all school employees who, um, you know, work so hard to make this happen. We, we uh, entered into this process like everywhere else in the world into a very uh, rapid uh, series of decisions um, without any game plan um, and have had to, uh, you know, work hard um, to figure out initially how to maintain educational contact with our students and then um, as of April 13th, sort of making this transition to what we call continuity of learning or the expectation that we try to um, support students through remote learning for the rest of the school year. But it's been a tremendous amount of work um, factoring in issues like, you know, feeding kids, um, providing supports, um, you know, for all parties involved, it's been a tremendous effort. Um, and I just I want to thank everyone for their cooperation. We know it's been a lot of work and families and children um, and employees uh, are under a lot of stress because of these challenges. But the good news is, um, as, as um, Eric was mentioning in the intro, um, Vermont's adopted a very disciplined approach uh, to social distancing and other mitigation strategies. And that's clearly paid off uh, for us as a state. Um, so much so now that we have a little bit of breathing room, I think, to plan for the fall. Um, and that's, that's a big part of the work uh, that we're engaging now at the agency. The um, last week I issued guidance in accordance with the governor's order on end of year celebrations uh, and graduations, uh, which was covered in the media pretty well. Um, but the other, the other key element of that guidance was um, about school calendars and basically how to set the trajectory for the remaining part of the school year. Um, the, the governor's original order um, closed school for in-person instruction for the remaining part of the school year unless ordered otherwise. So it still was a bit of an open question um, going back to March as to what extent we truly end up in the year in this disposition. And um, last week we more or less affirmed that we will uh, we'll finish out the year in remote learning um, and uh, you know, do our best to, um, within the public health guidelines, to celebrate uh, graduations and other uh, aspects of our students' year. So it's been a it's been a heck of a year for them. Uh, my heart goes out as a former principal to seniors in particular. Um, but I've seen some pretty uh, pretty creative ways uh, to celebrate their accomplishments. But I think it's fair to say. Uh, for them, this has turned into a senior year that none of us could have anticipated, but one I'm sure will be remembered for quite some time. Um, in terms of planning for the fall, <clears throat> I think, you know, one of the things we've established once again in Vermont is, I would say, a disciplined approach um, to using the best science and public health information, and that's really paid off. And um, I think Governor Scott has really set the tone for that um, and with his leadership, and it's something we're certainly uh, falling back on quite a bit to uh, inform our decision making on lots of levels, uh, but in particularly as it pertains to the fall. I'm just going to adjust my lighting a little bit. It's kind of dark here a little bit. The um, right now we have um, a planning effort that's starting um, about the fall. As you, if you follow the media nationally and internationally, uh, particularly uh, in Europe, there's been some countries that have opened schools uh, with limitations and certainly with um, disinfection and personal protection, PPE in place for students. So there's once again, no game plan on how to do this. Um, we're working as part of a, a national planning effort to understand how other states are responding to this. Um, but we will start our planning efforts uh, exactly uh, as we have all along and that's by factoring in uh, the public health guidance. So just to give you a sense on that timeline, um, we're, we're starting now to have focus meetings with our um, public health officials in Vermont and we'll likely uh, be tapping other expertise outside the state to help design. Um, firstly, what, what would be the safety and health parameters on which we could open school? And then from there, uh, we'll be engaging uh, stakeholders, uh, teachers, uh, school nurses, principals, community members, and so forth to uh, design uh, that approach. I think it's fair to say, uh, even though the specificity that hasn't been determined, it's fair to say that, um, firstly, 
uh, it won't be back to normal. You know, it's not, the emergency is not over. And I know um, there's an expectation, I think, particularly among school personnel that when the school year is over, um, you know, we can start over with a new year and so forth, but that's clearly not the case that um, we are, we are going to live with this disease for a bit. So um, the fall is not returned to normal pre-COVID-19 face-to-face uh, instruction. It's certainly our hope uh, that we'll able to have some sort of in-person instruction, um, but I'm, I'm pretty confident it won't be, uh, you know, as we knew it before. Um, certainly there's a lot that can happen between now and then in terms of better therapies, um, better control mechanisms and so forth. Uh, but, um, you know, we'll be, we'll be starting to do that planning now. And, and, and part of the reason we're doing that planning or have to do that planning now is that we have to uh, position school districts to do their planning. And there's actually a very limited opportunity for school districts to do uh, the, the professional development and planning that they need to in order to open school and to whatever that new normal will be. Um, they essentially, um, you know, have a, a matter of weeks essentially to do that planning. So we have to we have to get going pretty quickly from the state level on that. Um, we couldn't have gotten going sooner on that because we, you know, we're letting the latest public health information develop. Um, and once again, there's no roadmap for that. Uh, so, you know, that's that's ongoing piece of the work. Um, I'll also, I guess I'll comment on the financial situation a bit because a key part of um, provisioning services is having the money and the resources to do the services. Um, we're, we're kind of in this awkward place where, uh, you know, we've directed schools from the beginning of this emergency to um, do things they were never equipped to do necessarily, you know, beyond their mission, such as childcare and so forth. Um, and we've been using our school districts as part of our public infrastructure to support the, you know, the broader public during this emergency. And that's worked out quite well in terms of feeding children and so forth. Um, but now, of course, we're, uh, as we realized, there would, there would always be a bill to pay, so to speak. And um, so we're struggling a bit with the financial uh, aspects of the emergency. Uh, some part of that struggle is based on... Um, understanding how we could use federal monies to support our educational work. Uh, we have this thing called the CARES Act, uh, which you might be familiar with, and there's a, several pots of money in the CARES Act. They're, they're, the pots of money are all have different strings attached and different regulations, so you can't, you can't really just make the general statement CARES Act. There's several different components of that. There's a sizable pot of money uh, called uh, ESSER, which stands for the Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, uh, and that's approximately $30 million, of which 90% has to go directly to school districts. Um, and then there's a large pot of money, $1.2 billion, um, what we call the CRF, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, that comes to the state in general. And um, the challenge now, um, you know, we, we, I think we understand uh, how these uh, dollars function pretty well in the regulations and how they're different and so forth. Um, but the other issue is we have, as you can imagine, a significant shortfall in revenue at the state end, uh, and particularly in some of the revenue sources that um, make the Ed Fund uh, uh, fluid. So um, we have this challenge, as every state does. We have these regulations from the federal government that doesn't allow us to take uh, the coronavirus relief money and apply it to um, take care of a revenue shortfall. So. A lot of really difficult conversations now emerging in the legislature. I'm sure you saw in the media this week. Um, you know, I was part of some commentary in the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, you know, we basically in the last couple of weeks we've been really just trying to get our arms around, um, you know, all the various funding sources and all the options. And now we're down to that point where I think we know all the available options to a certain extent. Um, and now we have to make some difficult choices. So I think. Um, you know, that's what, that's what people should expect in the coming weeks as we um, get closer to that decision-making point. I will say um, next Tuesday, um, I think the conversation will uh, pick up again. We're, we're supposed to get a revised, the legislature will get a revised revenue projection, um, which will hopefully, uh, you know, make the, make the situation a little more optimistic. Um, we also know there's a new initiative in Congress, I think it's called the HEROES Act, which um, might provide greater flexibility in terms of federal support. So there's still a number of solutions possibly coming from the revenue side. But um, this week, uh, we, you know, we were interested certainly in bringing everyone's attention to the spending side or, or how we're going to tighten our belts essentially to 
um, navigate the crisis, and that that's still relatively unclear. Um, you know, you, I'm sure folks have heard. You know, we were talking about possibility of revoting school budgets. Um, you know, that was offered in the spirit of brainstorming. We didn't we didn't put a lot of specificity on that. It wasn't offered in that manner. Um, but I think you know the general observation that. Um, to think that the federal dollars right now, as we know them, will be sufficient uh, is, is uh, not enough information. We know even if we were able to apply uh, the funding um, in a, in totally towards education, that we'd still have a significant shortfall. And we also know there's going to be additional services that districts are required to provide that we, we haven't even accounted for. So for instance, I expect um, as we move more into the tail end of recovery uh, through this virus, and I'm not sure when that'll be, uh, we'll have additional mental health costs, additional special education costs, additional remediation costs that we don't, haven't even accounted for yet as a state, not just inside the education system. So, you know, the ongoing effects inside of education will be significant as they've been across all sectors of the economy. So really our observations this week relative to the funding situation we're just based on the sort of at a general level saying um, it's hard, to, it's unrealistic, I think, and hard to imagine how the K-12 system would escape um, some sort of adaptation as a result of this, this new economic reality when every other aspect of our uh, society is going to, um, you know, struggle and be transformed to a certain extent. In particular, when we consider um, the ability of property taxpayers to pay their property taxes, particularly when we're seeing significant unemployment rates. Um, highest they've been, if higher than the Great Depression. So um, all these things are coming together in a very difficult dynamic where, um, you know, we're certainly hopeful uh, that we'll have increased federal revenues because we do have new services that we're expecting the system to provide. Um, but I forgot who said once that, you know, hope is not a plan, you know, so uh, we also need to be planning appropriately. So, um, you know, once again, that's sort of the dynamic right now. I think, and to a certain extent, um, it's been a bit of a respite uh, for us inside of education. I know it's it's been it's hard to say that, but um, the first part of the emergency really was an emergency, and the the decisions were coming quickly, shutting down the school, a uh, very rapid process of provisioning services at the state level to ensure public safety. We have a bit of a window right now, as much as it's a painful window to contemplate the choices, but it is a bit of a window uh, for planning that uh, honestly we've achieved thanks to the discipline of Vermonters who've uh, embraced uh, the direction from the governor. So it's only because we together have worked together uh, to come up with a, a coordinated response to the virus that we're in the process, in the position now that we are to actually plan for the future a bit. Um, so that's that's the good news. Um, sort of the, the challenges though are significant and we have a lot of, uh, I would say, problems to solve and things to work through together as a education community as a state. So, um, you know, it's, I'm optimistic, I guess, uh, not just because um, we're in that position, um, because I just know the nature of uh, how our communities come together. So, um, you know, I think it's just the nature of the work today and, uh, you know, really personally, I'm very appreciative of people's patience and support. And um, I know our, our leadership team at the state level is also very appreciative. So, you know, why don't I leave it at that and I'd be happy to answer any questions folks might have. Thank you. So Brian, you wanna go ahead? Yep, uh, thank you, Secretary French. Uh, Rick Opperly, I've got you up first. Okay, go ahead, Rick. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Secretary French, I appreciate you. Uh, uh, taking the time to uh, uh, inform us. I listened to you last week and um, I, um, I work for a nonprofit therapeutic independent school here in Johnson uh, and uh, we work with a trauma informed approach and we focus on resiliency. Um, Laraway School. Um, the question I have is um, will there be support for programs like Laraway um, other than the SBA or the PPP. And I guess my, my real concern is uh, when Peter Welch was on last week, he kind of explained that the money comes in a pot and we kind of figure it out. Um, Laraway, um, a 40 year program with 150 plus or minus employees um, is, is an important institution in our community. 
And uh, I just don't know if the funding comes, uh, will, will it be equitable in the distribution of the funds or will we have to compete with say, maybe Chittenden County or more populous areas? Um, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I can pick this apart a couple different ways. One is uh, when we talk about the uh, ESSER funds, that uh, 30 million, 90% of which has to go to school districts, those funds will be distributed to school districts on a, on a formulaic basis that's largely based on uh, population and poverty levels. Um, the question is when those funds will be distributed, because right now we're caught up in this question at the, at the state level about, you know, the $170 million shortfall in the Ed Fund. So it's, it's not clear to me, um, you know, to Representative Welch's, it uh, sounds like he was describing how the ESSER funds might function to answer your question. <clears throat> I think I, what I would say as a response is, um, you know, just sort of outside of that conversation of how the ESSER funds function, um, where we're at in terms of managing fi from a financial perspective the crisis when you get down to issues like tuition payments to independent schools and contracted services. Uh, as we started the emergency response under the governor's order, districts were and are still required to maintain uh, essentially their payroll. So regardless of um, what function school employees might be performing, whether it's their regular assigned duties or not, uh, school districts were directed to maintain uh, their salaries, uh, largely because one, they already had that money in their budgets, but two, uh, it, was, it was really an economic stability measure uh, for our society. It wasn't directly related necessarily to provision of education services. What started to happen now though, though that's still in place, um, districts of course are feeling the financial constraints and the pressures and particularly as the, uh, the political discussion around the Ed Fund and and uh, the federal support becomes a little less clear. Um, we're starting to see, and predictably, districts are uh, becoming more cautious uh, and uh, conservative in their financial disposition. So where districts do have some flexibility is in contracted services. So um, in particular, um, if they have students, uh, let's say on special education students who have IEP plans that had services such like as mental health counseling, as an example, and now um, that those services are not being provided necessarily as originally planned before the COVID-19 response, districts are now re-evaluating re those contractual relationships because they have some flexibility to do that. The dilemma is on the other side of that is we, we need to maintain that infrastructure. So we're, we know we're gonna need uh, the mental health infrastructure. We know we're gonna need the therapeutic schools to be available to come back online. Um, as we move forward under this emergency. So right now, on the one hand, um, the money that, that really um, will benefit um, this sort of stability is, is emanating directly from the school district. It's not like your school would be necessarily competing with those. Uh, but the school districts are feeling constrained uh, because they've been asked to uh, do different things and expend resources, and it's not clear to what extent they're gonna be reimbursed. And at the other end of that, putting pressure in the other direction is we know there's going to be even more services in this area that uh, haven't been accounted for, as I alluded to earlier. So that's sort of the tension we're navigating right now. I expect um, part of what will, will help alleviate some of that friction in the near term is the application of some of those federal dollars that are, there's other pots of money I didn't specify earlier that might be available um, to take some of that tension away in the near term. Uh, but the longer term solutions are going to have to be, uh, sorry, I'm going to say renegotiated or reevaluated as, um, particularly as it pertains to schools like yours, uh, the, how the description of student services is articulated in student IEP plans and so forth. Thank you. Great. Well said. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I've got Eric Hutchins up, up next. Uh, hi. Okay. Uh, Secretary Go ahead. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I, I, I'm I uh, want to ask you about the, the governor's proposal to re-vote on uh, already democratically approved school budgets. Um, I feel that this would be both a public health and a logistical uh, disaster um, without much, uh, many benefits. Um, and I, you mentioned earlier that was, it was suggested in the spirit of brainstorming and lacked specificity, which uh, leads me to believe it's, it's not really 
based on the Democratic leadership's response, that it's not really a serious proposal. Uh, as a member of the Lamar Union High School staff and uh, the teachers union that's negotiating contracts right now, it would be uh, good to have some clarity on uh, the viability and seriousness of that proposal. And, and I hope it's there's not much seriousness to it, if you could respond to that. And as long as we're all here in the call, I, I don't see Senator Westman, but uh, Representative Hill and Representative Noyes are both here. I wonder how they feel about this proposal and if they'd be willing to support a revote on our already approved school budgets as well. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Um... Yeah, I think, you know, the in, it was in the spirit of brainstorming. I, I doubt the um, state representatives, in fairness to them, will have a much position other than a reaction to the general aspect of it, because lacking specificity, it's hard to commit to an opinion on it. But in terms of the uh, democratic nature of it, I mean, honestly, that was part of our interest in, in putting forth the idea of, um, you know, we could certainly do something more reactive at the state level, absent democratic input. And those, you know, I'll use the phrase clawback, um, has been done in the past where, um, you know, once again, this, this is not because people are interested in doing these things. It's like, these are the types of things that are being contemplated. And to their credit, the legislature, as much as uh, we're, I would say, somewhat dismissive of the idea, because it is, it's, uh, you know, it lacks specificity and it is, I would say, fairly dramatic. Um, to their credit, though, they still engaged uh, quite, I mean, I think critically, but proactively in a friendly way. It isn't, it isn't necessarily a confrontational situation, but it is a situation that we have to put ideas on the table. So I think, you know, on the one hand, as we were um, looking at it, we certainly thought there, there should be some conversation about spending on the table, and that's what prompted us to put uh, this measure on the table. The alternative that we also put on the table was something more reactive from a state perspective, meaning sort of like I was used to claw back, which is honestly still on the table from both, you know, both political sides. And I can talk about that separately in a second. But um, education spending could be set at the state level as a part of this emergency. And as we examine that, we didn't think that was necessarily a good approach either. Um, so what we were promoting is essentially what state government's going through, which is like, well, let's break the fiscal year down into parts because we very well might have good news at the end of the first quarter relative to state revenues or, or, or federal spending. So who knows? But the point about democracy is that when voters did make those decisions, of course, in March, that was before the pre-COVID-19 uh, situation. So arguably, you can make the case they were voting based on a recommendation from the tax commissioner that was made in December 1 about revenues and protected tax rate. And those assumptions are honestly irrelevant at this point. So it's not a, it's not a good answer, you know, in terms of a proposal, but it's honestly to put, to put the spending issue on the table, I think is a responsible one at this point. But I think we'll see how the conversation goes next week. And that's what I encourage you to just to watch how that unfolds. Um, I think the revenue projections will add more energy to that. Um, but even just looking at the revenues right now, there's still a sizable hole that we have to fill. I'm not sure how it'll, it'll unfold, but. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd say putting these burdens back on communities to revote. I know the, the, the ed formula and the property tax formula is designed to create equity between wealthy and, and poorer towns. Um, but it's pretty clear that uh, wealthy towns would be more likely to repass school budgets, whereas towns that have a lot of struggles would be more likely to vote them down, just, just you know, magnifying the inequity that already exists in, in the formula. So that's something to seriously consider, I think. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, there was, I think, a part of your question where you asked if uh, our representatives would like to respond. Matt or Dan, would either of you like to respond? Okay. Uh, Matt, I've got you up first. Okay, sure. Um, thanks for Eric's great question. And, uh, you know, I'm, unfortunately, um, I don't have a great answer for you. Um, you know, uh, you know, the secretary is right. It was, you know, kind of just thrown out there and, and, uh, the legislature kind of scrambled to get an answer. Um, and, and it was pretty much dismissed. Although we do have an issue, um, you know, some communities are seeing a very giant increase in, in their tax burden. Um, for their property taxes and we're going to have a situation where some people just simply can't like are literally not going to be able to afford it um so there's going to have to be something whether uh you know I don't, you know whether it comes from federal help or if it comes from a tax increase somewhere around the line to fill the hole that uh, the secretary mentioned um we're, you know there, the, some action has to be taken um and you know 
we're, we, we, we simply can't do, uh, you know, we can't, we can't leave it alone. We're going to have to um, make sure that we, uh, you know, attack it from, from many sides and hopefully that we can get some many ideas on the table that we can kind of evaluate, but um, holding a revo, um, unfortunately, is probably not um, plausible at this point in time. Thank you. And Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree with Matt there. I mean, um, you know, it was a proposal that was put out there. Um, we are, today we passed stuff, the, uh, our new pre-budget coming pretty quick. Um, and then we're going to adjourn to really look at what the revenue projections are for this fall and, uh, or actually late summer. And also to what um, uh, there'll be lots of ideas. You'll hear all kinds of stuff in the next few months coming out of there. But, uh, you know, we've got some bright people, uh, definitely on the, the money committees. And uh, I'm sure we'll come up with something that's equitable and uh, is able to make sure our schools are funded. Thank you. All right, uh, Beth Foy, I've got you up next. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, thanks for joining us, uh, Secretary. Uh, we appreciate it. My question for you is, I don't, um, I guess I'm not following where the loss of revenue is for the education agency specifically right now. Um, I totally see loss of revenue in a lot of different agencies, but uh, I can't say that yours is one of them that is apparent to me at the moment. Um, I can understand how it will be an issue, you know, six months from now, but I don't see it right now. Can you explain a little bit more in detail about what that loss of revenue looks like right now? Yeah, sure. Um, it's not the agency's revenue, it's the education fund, uh, which is essentially a separate fund. Uh, that's where all the property taxes go. Um, but there's also other revenues that go into an additional property taxes, it's those other revenues that are down, sales tax revenues and so forth. So it's the lack of sales tax and so forth that's created a substantial hole in the ed fund. Okay, thank you. Um, and the, I guess the second to that is I would be interested to understand what the lack of those taxes are compared to those contracted services. I'm sure the contracted services are a huge part of the budget. And if you know we're due to a crisis, a, um, a federal crisis, I would imagine some of those contracts we aren't having to pay out. So how does that balance out right now? And what is the projection from, for six months from now? Yeah. Well, the questions of the future are easy to answer because I can't predict the future, you know, and I think particularly in a crisis, this is really especially hard. I think the easy way to, and it's a complicated funding system, as you know, um, the easy way to look at it is, you know, based on all the school district budgets that were passed, and we have, I think, 19 school districts that still don't have budgets. Uh, but based on that, the legislature sets a yield value and we predict uh, what the total ed spending will be on a state level and we can translate that into the property tax rate. Um, with the revenue shortfall, not even talking about the, uh, the increased services, the contracts, so to speak, that we're gonna have as a result of COVID-19, but just based on the budgets that were passed pre-COVID-19, uh, we are pr projected to be short $170 million, which translates to about a 20, 20, to, 5 cent, 20 to 25 cent tax property tax increase per hundred. So just to give you a sense of the magnitude of the problem. Um, so, and that's before we factor in uh, any new expenses as a result of COVID-19 contracted service and so forth. It's just the fact that we do not have the money to pay for the budgets that were already approved based on previous assumptions, which is also, I have to mention, pretty dramatic because we had, prior to COVID-19, we were sitting pretty well as a state. We had a, there's a reserve that's required to be in the Ed Fund. Um, we have a bit of a surplus that was in the Ed Fund, so things were looking really good. And now we're in like the worst case scenario as a result of um, the revenues um, declining. Um, okay, I just would like to advocate really quickly for our schools planning. Um, I would imagine that there are multiple plans for fall. And I think we can all imagine that, you know, the new normal is not what we, what the old normal was. Um, so I think that, um, I don't know what the timeline is for those plans, but I know our teachers are working really hard and I'm concerned for their welfare, frankly. Um, and I think having multiple plans available and ready to pull out 
um, for our schools to begin planning now is extremely important. And I hope David Manning, our um, local elementary school principal, uh, could speak to that a little bit, or maybe Kat, who is the um, superintendent, either one of you, because um, I just feel for our, our, our faculty and staff right now. Um, yeah, that's that's why the state level planning is really starting with the public health information because we have, <clears throat> before we get too far into the specifics of the planning, we have to really evaluate how we can ensure students and staff will be safe in the schools. You know, what are there going to be those sort of baseline public health guidance? And then uh, we'll, we'll be producing a framework, but then schools will have flexibility under that framework. But really, my, my uh, analysis right now indicates that that public health guidance will be sort of defining. I mean, that's not something we're going to, we can't afford to have individual districts adopt different public health standards. Um, but that once we can nail that down a bit, um, and I agree, sooner is better than later, uh, then districts will be able to go forward with their local planning. All right, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Beth, sorry, if uh, David or Kat wanted to speak uh, to add anything to that. All right, I don't want to catch them out. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, we've got a question from Walter, uh, and then we'll get back. Okay, Walter, go ahead. Thank you, Secretary, for uh, joining us tonight. Um, now, I know this isn't directly your purview, but we have a lot of interest in the Vermont college system here in Johnson. And to, to a certain extent, your programs are linked to ours. And so I was hoping you could comment a little bit. Uh, one, a source of revenue and an important function um, that you provide is early college. And uh, do you foresee that being on the chopping block as part of we need to save ourselves a few dollars? And two, do you realize how important our school, our Vermont State College system is to that program and to the students in this area? And I don't know if you have weighed in in terms of with the chancellor or the, the board of trustees on this issue. Yeah, I, um, I, I don't have, you know, as you alluded to, I don't have direct uh, oversight of the state college system, but I've certainly been a participant in most of these conversations in the last month. and. Uh, mostly listening uh, and also uh, certainly at the cabinet level as we discuss these issues. Um, you know, I know uh, in terms of, uh, I'll say the bridge funding issue, the legislature is certainly interested in uh, what I, this is just what I listened to, that they're interested in supporting some sort of uh, way to sustain the system, uh, but also expecting um, some changes perhaps as a result of that guaranteed, but I don't know anything more about that aspect of it. In terms of the early college, um, we haven't gone as far as to start suggesting cutting programs that early college, uh, dual enrollment, those things are funded from the Ed Fund. Those are, there's some state level activities. So, um, you know, the first thing is to try to find the revenue sources or the adjustments at the state level that um, can self balance the education fund exactly, essentially. Um, but I think the next, the next place we will go are cuts. And, um, what we're doing right now in state government is we're uh, basically producing a first quarter budget, uh, what we call our skinny budget, if you will. Uh, so we're, we've been asked to, um, you know, navigate the first quarter with an assumption of an 8% reduction in our agency funding. Um, we think we can do that fairly easy in the agency of education without getting into student programs. And, and I should mention to Beth's earlier comment, the agency is not funded by the education fund except for a, a very, very small percentage of money that we use because we administer the education fund, but we get no operating uh, revenues from the education fund. That's all sort of K-12 uh, property tax. So, you know, the specific issues on, um, you know, whether we get into cutting programs or not, those will certainly be issues for the legislature to contemplate, but within managing our operational budget, um, I don't think we'll be, we'll be forced uh, to cut uh, many programs, largely because the Agency of Education doesn't rely on many general fund dollars to operate. Most of our programs are funded by federal dollars. 
um, because you know most of our functions are oversight of federal grants and so forth. Um, but I think you know the other thing I'd mention on on your point is that uh, we still have policy priorities in the state, and one of the policy priorities is uh, you know greater flexibility and personalization of learning, and particularly college and career readiness. So. Um, you know, those priorities are, are going to stay priorities. I, I, I can't imagine uh, deviating from that as a result of the crisis and are probably going to be more important than they ever have been. So, um, but I would just observe, and it was part of my, uh, you know, discussion with the Waves and Means Committee the other day, uh, when we contemplate the challenges that are facing higher ed across the country, including our state college system, when we contemplate the changes and challenges our hospital systems are going through and uh, small businesses and so forth. It's it's once again it's hard for me to imagine how the K twelve system wouldn't be somehow affected uh, by this larger, um, you know, societal and economic uh, crisis that we're navigating. So I just you know I think it's incumbent upon me to start preparing uh, the K twelve system for for those changes. I'm not sure yet what shape they'll take, but um, you know the the policy policy prioritization on higher ed is still there. Uh, it's just a question of how that's going to manifest itself in terms of financial commitment. And I'm, I'm not uh, necessarily a major player in that, though I am, you know, I do, I am listening. And, and certainly, as you pointed out, we have programs that interface pretty tightly with higher ed. It's a critical part of uh, our ability to provision programs for student success in Vermont. And to, I mean, you just almost touched on my second question is, I don't know if you have the figures or the facts of how many of our educators and paraeducators come out of these school systems. Right. And you're talking about possibly if you get rid of the Northern Vermont universities, how you're going to cut off that pipeline of our future teachers and the impact yeah, that that will have on your system. I don't know if you can put a number on that or contemplate that, that uh, possibility. Yeah, I can't uh, necessarily. It's it's a it's to a certain extent a hypothetical, but we have seen a general retraction of those programs uh, prior to becoming secretary. I'm on my almost on my second year on the job. I was working at St. Michael's College where I was on the faculty there. I ran the uh, principal licensure program. I I a little bit was in touch with the undergraduate uh, dimensions, and we we seem to maintain a robust uh, program there. But that was largely, from my perception, sustained by out of state folks. Um, but I know working closely with UVM, UVM has also seen, um, you know, a drop on the number of folks interested in going into teaching. Um, but yeah, these institutions, you know, play a critical role in preparing uh, our schools and our workforce of the future. So it's, it's going to be a challenging conversation, just like many other challenging conversations we're faced with these days. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Secretary French. Uh, did we have anybody else who wants to speak? Okay, I see a couple hands up. Uh, it was like Kent Gallagher, the uh, superintendent. Um, hi, thank you. Thank you for um, taking my message. Uh, Secretary French, thank you for being here today. I recognize that this has been a, a very difficult time for our teachers and, and staff. Um, as well as the students in the community. We didn't have much planning time when we went into crisis mode. We're in a different situation now. I think, you know, we are being guided to plan for various contingencies. And I think that we know what has worked and what has not worked well with remote learning. So we will be looking to tighten that up. Um, I think we will have some uh, designated time this summer to work specifically on plans for the fall and, uh, well, summer and fall. And we are working to make sure that our teachers and staff get the support that they need to do that. And we are getting support from the agency to make sure that that happens. So um, those would be my comments. Great, Thank you. thanks. Good to hear from you. Thank you, Kat. Uh, and I've got uh, Shane up. Uh, okay, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Secretary, for being here. Um, so you mentioned uh, just a minute ago that you were looking at an 8% cut in your uh, agency spending this year. And the NVU Strong Committee, I know I'm not sure about any of the other schools committees, but they were tasked with a 15 to 25% cut. Um, can you speak to... I know, again, that's not your purview fully, but can you speak to why the difference in those two cuts? 
Yeah, there are t- two different organizational contexts. Um, you know, we when I said 8%, that's not 8% cut for the year. It's really uh, for the first quarter. So basically, we're breaking down the year into quarters. Um, and uh, we're the direction we have a, an agency of administration that sort of sets the direction on how state departments and agencies are administered. Uh, our budget instructions are to prepare a, a first quarter budget to see if we can get by on an 8% annualization, you know, a reduction in this first quarter with the hope that it would be, um, you know, we'll know more about the future regardless and we'll see, uh, you know, cuts will be coming so forth. But, um, you know, the, the financial and the organizational context are totally different. You know, one, the state college systems, they're, they're operating uh, costs and the, the inability to, um, what I understand the financial conversation, the difficulty to make payroll even through uh, the, sh- the rest of the summer and then, uh, I think like most higher educational institutions, it's an open question of what the fall is going to look like and how critical from a financial perspective that decision becomes for so many colleges. Our dorms going to be open and so forth. So it's a totally different business context per se. And, um, you know, the state college system is, is a separate entity relative to state government. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, uh, I think Leah Hollenberger had uh, comment on this. Okay, go ahead, Leah. Hi, and Secretary French, thank you for being here. Um, Shane, I want to take a minute. Uh, I'm Leah Hollenberger with Northern Vermont University, and I just wanted to address your question, Shane. The 15 to 25% budget cut, that figure comes from um, actually NVU's own figures. Our Board of Trustees asked all of the institutions um, in the state college system to prepare a fiscal year 21 budget Um, with the assumption that there's no additional state appropriation. And in doing so, we had to take a look at what our projected enrollment will be in the fall, given post-COVID, given the, quite honestly, the damage from the proposed closure of the university. So taking into account all of these various um, parameters, the 15 to 25% budget cut um, is what we are projecting needed in order to live within a, a fiscal year 21 budget. That's what the um, uh, that's what we've been tasked with immediately um, for the board to review, much as everybody else is reviewing and preparing for their fiscal year 21 fiscal budget. At the same time, the legislators are working with um, Beth Pierce and the state treasurer's office is doing a review of the system's finances and the legislators are also working with um, former chancellor of the University of Maine system, Jim Page. He's also doing a review, and that I believe is um, what the legislators plan to use to help them determine um, state appropriation. So there's a number of different um, reviews and projections that are happening um, all along at the same time, but in different arenas. But I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, Rick Opperly had raised his hand. I can. Okay, um, so again, uh, sort of along the lines of the question I asked before, um, I'm the school to work coordinator at Laraway School, and my role is to try to find opportunities for students to work in the community. Um, I just wonder, um, is, will there be support uh, along the way, uh, development grants or assistance uh, with transition from high school to the workforce um, for, for our students at Laraway? Yeah, hi Rick. I'm not I'm not aware of any specific targeted funds down to that sort of level of precision. Though I will say, <clears throat> from a general perspective, we anticipate um, both in the funds that we have through ESSER and uh, possibly the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund as well. That um, in a broad way, right now, our our um, as I mentioned, we anticipate to have more needs in the area of financial needs in the area of social and emotional supports for students. And I'd throw special ed programming such as transition services in that category. Um, so I think you know we're we're definitely thinking along those lines that that's the place where we have to reserve um, capacity with our new federal money to uh, anticipate there's going to be significant need in this area. 
not only during uh, sort of the next period of remote learning or whatever the fall might bring, um, but also as we come out of this crisis that there's gonna be uh, uh, new needs that we haven't even accounted for yet. Many of our students um, will be in the area. They're not moving on. And uh, many of them will need um, assistance in uh, finding employment and kind of helping them uh, into the next uh, stage of, uh, of life. So uh, it's pretty important on the local level. Uh, we've had good success with our school to work program and uh, look forward to getting back out in the field where we can uh, really make a difference. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, Eric Hutchins had a follow-up question. Uh, okay, uh, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again, Secretary French. Um, so uh, two months ago today, back on March 15th, many of my colleagues and I were thrown into an environment where we weren't doing you know, brick and mortar building education, but exclusively online in, in two days. Uh, and many of my colleagues didn't have any training or experience in that venue. And I think they've done a remarkable job adapting on very short notice. Um, but as we look forward to the fall, uh, when we're looking at, you know, maybe we'll be in the building, maybe we won't. Maybe we'll be in the building for a while and then we'll be out. Maybe some kids will want to come in the building and some kids and their families won't be comfortable coming in the building. So we're really going to end up preparing for both a in-school model and an online model and a model where kids are at home and they don't have access to the internet. So, uh, you know, a printed curriculum that, that is delivered and, and returned to the school in a number of different ways. So there's really a whole bunch of different eventualities we need to prepare for. And I'm wondering if any of the, um, the, the federal grant of the emergency relief coronavirus relief funds will be earmarked for uh, school prep and teacher prep and training uh, and helping us get ready and plan for not just one schedule and traditional model of education, but for a wide variety of different expectations. I mean, I know my colleagues are already thinking about ways that we can prepare for the fall and the number of different resources and professional development that we might need in order to enable, you know, not just one, but several different types of learning over different levels. And it's super different for elementary school kids than it is for high school kids. And uh, a lot of, you know, there's, there, we have a lot of needs in this area uh, as we have kids with multiple um, home issues and technology issues and frankly motivation issues when they're not in the school building every day that we need to address. Um, so I mean, other than the, the ESSA funds, is there anybody thinking about the emergency relief fund as an aid to education for coronavirus related expenses? Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you you did a good survey of all the potential possibilities, you know, um, and we need to prepare for all of them. And I think, you know, particularly we call continuity of learning and remote learning, as much as folks were thinking the fall would be a return to normal, that being able to provision education through technology or remote delivery of, you know, on paper resources, that still needs to be in our portfolio of options. And I think you're right that the coordination, the planning necessary to do a mixed delivery model of some sort of in-person, some sort of online fluid groups in ways we've never anticipated will require uh, significant planning and not only from a logistics standpoint, but just from an educational standpoint. So um, yeah, and this is one of, uh, to the point back uh, to your earlier question about the financial dynamics where um, a lot of the conversation that's gone on in the last couple of weeks has been focused on using the different pots of money at the federal level. And to my point earlier that they're not all the same. Some of the pots, uh, particularly the ESSER funds of which 90% uh, were targeted to go to school districts would impart the flexibility that totally would allow them to support the planning costs and professional development and all those kinds of things easily. I mean, that's essentially what they're designed to do. Um, on the other hand, the CRF uh, money, which is the big pot of money, you know, that 1.2 billion, um, as we think about, I'll go back to use the phrase clawback sort of swap, um, using the ESSER funds to somehow short the education fund payments to school districts, but then providing access to school districts for the CRF funds. There's a couple problems with that because they're not apples to apples comparison. One is the CRFNs don't have the flexibility. So basically, um, they're designed to reimburse municipalities and could include, include school districts for costs explicitly related to coronavirus relief. So 
it becomes harder to justify, I think, professional development and training, qualifying for CRF, would it be very easy to qualify it under the ESSER fund. Um, and the other thing is the timelines are different on the fund. So the ESSER fund money that was go to districts can be used all the way out through um, September of 2021. The CRF fund expires, the money has to be spent by this December. So, um, you know, as much as we're, we're in, I mean, these are all hard decisions and we're playing with these pots of money. Once again, part of our interest in putting spending on the table is that there, there's some assumptions, I think, around uh, the federal money uh, that it can be used. And I, th I think legislators for their credit know the, the limitations on this, but the points you raise um, are, I would say, similar to the ones I'm making about the things we don't even know yet that are going to cost money. And uh, the, the, the cards we've been dealt so far from the federal government um, are not going to be inadequate, both to fill um, the revenue shortfall in the Ed Fund and to provide the adequate flexibility uh, to meet the, the provisioning of services. And they're going to be insufficient to, um, to support the needs of students, particularly those uh, handicapped students and the students who need the social and emotional support. So we're not, I'm, I'm not expecting to say the federal government is done on this by any means. Um, but what we've been dealt so far is, is just the beginning and it's, it's structurally proving to be very inadequate to um, the nature of the, the need that's out there. Thank you. Okay. Brian, we're closing in on an hour, so why don't we take one more question or comment and then we'll continue on with the program. Okay. Uh, Dave Manning had a comment and this, this will be our last one. Okay, Dave, go ahead. Um, I'm having some audio connection issues with you. I still can't uh, hear anything. It looks like that's. All right. Um, so I think we'll have to circle back with uh, Dave another time. Um, I know that, yeah, uh, Dave, if you want to type what you're thinking into chat, we'll make sure that everybody uh, gets it there. But, um, you know, I, I want to thank Secretary French for coming on. I want to thank all of our uh, representatives of the, the schools and everything else we were able to take a few minutes to talk uh, and answer questions and uh, I'll turn it back over to Eric Osgood. Yeah, Thank you very much. Let, Have a good night. Let me just echo the same uh, sentiments of Brian. Uh, thank you, Secretary French, for coming over to Johnson, zooming into Johnson for tonight. We really appreciate it and, and thank you for taking your time. My pleasure. Uh, Have a good week. You're more than welcome to stick around for a little bit of entertainment now. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa. I'll leave you to it. Have a good night. Okay, Thank good you. night. It's yours. Hi, Brian. May I share my screen? Yes. Thank you. Um, May is virtual race month, and we have a donation from Ebenezer Bookstore for our raffle prizes. So if you do any virtual race, and there's tons and tons of them out there, um, you just email to me that you've completed one and you'll be entered into our raffle drawing. Um, you can check out the johnsonrecreationbt.com and you'll get links to some races that I'm interested in and feel free to share on Facebook so we can get a community of what's happening and share with one another. Um, I posted in the chat, we're gonna be doing a family feud game next week and we will need people to answer that survey so we can get the top answers on the board from the town. Um, we had an update from Eric earlier about the playgrounds and we will be revisiting that each week because we do, as soon as it's safe, we wanna get them opened up again for people to enjoy. Um, and I've been meeting often with the Lamoille County Little League. And if you have a student or child interested in Little League, Babe Ruth, or Legion Baseball, you can go ahead and email me and I'll get some updates for you on that. We are not cleared for play yet, but we are preparing to be ready to go as soon as we are. Um, so that is the rec update for this week. And tonight I am happy to um, introduce my friend, Sam Averbuck, and he will be 
playing some music for us to enjoy. So grab the rest of the family and let's enjoy some music from Sam. Thank you, Sam. You're welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks everybody for uh, having me let me play. It's It's been a while since I've gotten to play in front of anybody. So uh, here we are. I'll, uh, I'll just get right to it. Thanks again, everybody, for having me. <clears throat> Make sure that guy's coming through. There's no combination of words I can put on the back of a postcard. No song that I can sing, but I can try for your heart. Our dreams, they are made out of real things like shoebox and photographs. We see if you're torn in love. Love is the answer to these things. So the question of my heart, like, why are we here from where we go? And how come it's so hard? And it's not always easy, and sometimes not to be deceived. I'll tell you one thing, it's always better when we're together. Ooh, it's always better when we're together. Yeah, well, if we can start to live together, well, it's always better when we're together. Yeah, it's always better when we're together. It's just my time to my dreams tonight But I know that they'll be gone From the morning I sing It brings new things But tomorrow night you see That they'll be on to To many things I have to do But if all these dreams might find the way To my day to be seen I leave under the impression I was somewhere in between With only two, just me and you And that's so many things we got to do All places we got to be To sit beneath the main now. Yeah, it's always better when we're together. Ooh, somewhere in between together. Well, it's always better when we're together. Yeah, it's always better when we're I'm going to take a little bit of my own sleep. I'm going to hit three of losing my shirt. I'm going to be teaching. 
you look at me and I'll be wrong to the side and said, I'm sorry. Five days it's a lot that you were in. You just did what I thought that you were gonna do. Three days in the living room. Three days in the brain. But what did we do yesterday? You just smiled at me. I said, back the way that you say a smile. Bum, bum, bum. Well, I want you to China, the Chinese chicken. You have a drumstick and your brain stops ticking. Well, watch your next five when the lights on, when it's the mayor's on. When well, the spooky was in this one, like Arizona, Puerto Rican, frantic. I say I'm tantric, a speaker's guaranteed to satisfy. The girl was out, I make bad bills, yeah, I don't make bills. But if it didn't help us, they were right. If you get a sympathetic from the telly, I can't even notice all my friends, I'm always right off the back swing. If you do too much, I'm going to get to the show. I'm going to be there. Maybe think of one thing. I can't help but feel the thing is running when you're mad. I'm trying hard not to smile, but what do you mad? I'm the kind of guy that laughs at a funeral. Can't okay, understand what I mean. You soon will. I have a tendency to whip a mind on my sleeve. I have a history of taking off my shirt. Just give me another one beat since you looked at me. And I'll be on the side and said, I'm sorry. Five days since you laughed at me. You just get back to love to see me. Three days in the living room. I realize I'm both afraid, but what could we do? Yes, a day you just smile at me. And I'll sit back and wait until you say, Sorry, it'll still lead you to something we say we're sorry. A virtual stadium of the rally. Thank you, Sam. Hey, thank you guys, no problem. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll get to do it again sometime. Absolutely, thank you, Sam. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of the night, guys. Lisa, if you don't have anything else, I believe Casey was going to talk for a few minutes or a few seconds about the uh, skate park and what some of the protocols will be. Did you cover protocols when you spoke earlier? Because I came in late to the meeting. No, basically, I just generally spoke to it that it was going to be opened up and maintaining the social distancing. Uh, and that was about it. Right. OK. Going to be a ten-person limit in the skate terrain area, overall, always, uh, and don't anticipate any problems in the bike track areas. But skate terrain, yes, uh, we're going to put up signs starting tomorrow. I, I hear the town will start clearing trees next week, but there's still, you know, plenty and enough open area for people to skate tomorrow. Um, we won't have water till who knows when, because it just can't be kept safe. Uh, ditto the bike repair stand, because uh, we can't keep the tools clean. So those two things will, be, will stay closed off. Um, we also, of course, will be, uh, the, the third, there's three, three main legs of uh, what riders need to be aware of. Um, social distancing, the, the notion of play but don't stay, and, you know, don't hang around afterwards and make room for more people who want to maybe use, use the terrain. Uh, and um, uh, gosh, oh, the additional things, sorry, the additional things were that we added today were um, putting up some additional legal language that is from the ACCD, uh, which governs all recreation areas about who can use who can use the park and so forth. Um, uh, uh, last thing, two last things. We will be on areas that where on ramps, particular ramps where people might tend to congregate. We'll do some six foot markings the way they do in supermarkets. Uh, and last, um, a I want to thank Dave Manning for helping us get signs laminated under a time crunch. And huge thanks to Lisa, uh, because without her, we wouldn't have nice looking colored signs and you know general guidance and moral support. Thanks. Great, thank you, Casey. Welcome. And with that, uh, we'll see everyone next week. But as of right now, have a safe weekend. Y'all yeah. too. Good night.